uh, Brian, it says, how do you come up with characters and location names? Uh, character and location names. So, uh, lots of different viable options here, all right? Um, one that I like to do is I like to build up simple linguistic rules for a culture and then try to build names out of those. This requires a little bit of linguistics background, uh, which you can pick up by reading on it or taking some classes on it. It's really fascinating stuff and really handy. Um, and sometimes these tricks are built around sounds, um, like I use in the Stormlight Archive. Sometimes they're built around interesting linguistic quirks, uh, like you know, repeated consonant sounds for the names uh, in Warbreaker and things like this. Um, Another way you can do it, however, is that you can kind of shortcut this by picking a region or culture on Earth um, and kind of dig into that language of that specific region. Get yourself an atlas, look at it and say, all right, this, this region, this specific region in England has names that are kind of all feel similar to one another. Um, what are the sounds that they are using? What are the what are the types of um, of prefixes, suffixes, the morphemes? Morphemes are like um, the I, what's the actual technical term for morpheme? It's like the building blocks of words, the syllables, kind of. Uh, a linguist can explain that better. Peter could explain that better. Um, but you know what what kind of re sounds are you seeing? What types of syllables are you seeing over and over again? Um, you know, are you looking at a uh, region where Heim as a kind of Germanic um, uh, meaning for, for town comes in? Um, you see that quite a bit in, uh, in people who are, who are basing on kind of some of the, the old Germanic sort of feel for, for words and uh, city names. And they're like, oh, you know, I'll call this blah, blah, blah Heim with the blah, blah, blah being replaced with something actually legitimate. That sort of thing. Um, what, do, what are you saying from that region? Build up names and linguistics that way. Um, that works pretty well. Uh, another way you can approach it, though, is you can say, what is the, the feel I want for the characters in this story? What type of story am I telling, right? If you are writing a Regency romance, you're going to want words that are names that work really well with Mr. or, you know, Miss in front of it, right? Because you tell stories about a Mr. Darcy. Um, so you want something that works with the number of syllables in a word very well to flow off the tongue with that sort of thing. Whereas if you're building a high story like Mistborn, you're often going to want to use names that are evocative of, um, you know, some sort of nickname, some sort of loose, free form. You know, people on thieving crews are going to have nicknames. They're going to have... Um, this, this feel of camaraderie of being part of a team, you're going to often look for, you know, the one-syllable names, ham and breeze, um, and things like that, just because it feels light and airy and fast and quick, and that enhances a thieving crew. So, you know, those are like three different methods. The hardcore kind of Tolkien-esque route, which um, I will not by any means claim to be the philologist that, uh, that Tolkien was, but that sort of first route. Second route is kind of build up from what exists on Earth and try to use that as a model. And the third is ask what your story demands. Try to design names that are going to feel right for the type of story you're telling. And just so you know, we are now up on YouTube for sure. For sure on YouTube. For sure. I had well. to create a new stream. It wasn't going to the other one for some reason, but we're good and getting comments. All Sorry right. for the mix-up, everyone. But Adam, you are wonderful. Thank you for the uh, technical assistance. Uh, always at least one thing has to happen during one of these streams. Well, we hope that many things happen in these streams. But yes, technical one difficulties. One thing has to go wrong. Yes. yes. Um, Aiden Darcy um, mm. wants to know what your favorite subreddits are. Uh, my favorite subreddits? Um, so, other than the subreddits dedicated to my books, which people <laughs> tend to be very uh, good with, um, I'm going to say that I will most often haunt the games and video games that I enjoy. Like, I really enjoy the, the R-Civ 
um, the Civilization uh, subreddit. It's fun. Civilization is one of my favorite games. Uh, the Dark Souls subreddits all tend to be really solid and fun to read, particularly when people are doing fashion souls and showing off their, their costumes and outfits. Um, uh, of course, Magic TCG. Um, it is big enough as a subreddit now that it has the kind of growing pains that really large subreddits have, where a lot of people disagree on the, the fo what the focus of it should be, but it is a well done uh, subreddit. Probably the single best subreddit, in my opinion, on Reddit is r slash fantasy. Uh, it is really well moderated in a way that is conducive to good conversations, but not heavy handed. Uh, the people there tend to be just really passionate about fantasy. Um, and um, it just, it's, it's been a solid community that does a really good job of focusing on a lot of the smaller authors as well, which is something I think that the community does really well and I appreciate. Um, and then the, the specialist subreddits, Ask Historians um, is just wonderful. Um, I tend to really like that one. And um, subreddits along those lines, the, the various science ones and whatnot, just really great information on that. Um, you know, whatever the legal advice one, the, the same way, just kind of teaches me things that I need to know for writing that it's really hard to get otherwise and tend to, the ones that tend to be really strictly moderated there. Um, I do not understand Wall Street bets, but those people are fascinating. Um, I do go there on occasion. Uh, Tim Halsey from Facebook uh, wants to know if you've ever considered writing one of your books primarily from the villain's point of view and um, wants to know if there's any information about the U.S. Rhythm of War cover that you can share. Okay, so um, first question, writing from the villain's point of view. So yes, I have considered it. Um, I do think that that is... Uh, that is an interesting and fun thing to do, particularly if you play with what, what, what does it mean to be villain, what does it mean to be antagonist, right? And what does it mean to be protagonist? Um, the classic, or the most recent, I guess you could call it classic already, example being Infinity War in which uh, Thanos is both the villain and the protagonist of the, the movie at the same time, uh, which is really cool to see. Um, and, you know, whether... Th there's also this sort of... People are... They're the bad guys, but they're also the hero and the protagonist, even though, you know, this is the, this is the, the thieving crew sort of thing, which is not what you're asking. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is yes. I'm more likely to do a, sh a novella from that viewpoint, most likely because um, of various things, but there's a decent chance I will someday do the, an actual full novel from a villain's viewpoint. Um, what was the second question on that? Oh. Uh cover of Rhythm of War. Uh, so Michael just um, settled on a sketch. Uh, so Michael Whalen's doing it. And the way that this works um, in the U.S. is Michael, who is, you know, Michael Whalen. He is the single greatest uh, fantasy artist who has ever lived. Um, he will send us a whole bunch of sketches and he'll do a whole bunch of studies. Um, and he'll be like, what works? What am I fat excited by? Things like that. And we'll get like 30 of these things. And we'll just uh, say, we like these ones a little better for this reason and whatnot. Isaac will work with him. We'll get another round and things like that. We just settled on a sketch, um, which means that now he's probably going to do color studies on that sketch, um, followed by um, probably some short studies of the actual posings, followed by a full painting. Um, uh, you could ask Michael his actual process, but it's something along those lines. So we're still several months out probably from a full painting. Um, from Michael, but we have settled on the the actual picture, uh, so the actual you know posing and everything like that. So it's gonna it's gonna look nice. Um, I'm really excited for it. And while Brandon is moving these, if you haven't seen the UK cover for Rhythm of War, we just announced that last week. So you can find that on Brandon's social media, or if you're on YouTube, uh, we uploaded a little video for the cover reveal for that. Yep. Um, I would expect maybe July, early July would be my guess, but. You know, we don't rush Michael Whalen, um, and he uh, he takes projects based on what he's really interested in doing, uh, rather than um, you know any other purpose. So we're just really lucky to have Michael. Um, he's my favorite artist. So um, I'm going to do a fan mail because April has sent me a pen. Hello, Brandon. 
I have recently started word turning and I made the enclosed pen. If you have time for a question, we know carpentry is a masculine activity and art is feminine. Where does something like carving or turning fall? Uh, would it be a form of art or more like carpentry? Uh, so April, most cases it's gonna go carpentry. It's gonna go carpentry, it's gonna go craft, it's gonna go masculine. Um, most crafts, however, and boring culture can kind of go each direction. Um, and you will find a lot of husband-wife teams um, where who does what gets very kind of tricky based on their own kind of feelings socially and things like that. Um, and so, you know, a pen like this, I could see a team making. I could see either gender making it in, um, in on Roshar. Um, and again, it's going to depend on devotion, how, how conservative your personal culture is, um, and all of those sorts of things. But, uh, this is really awesome. Uh, pens are cool. It's beautiful. Um, I really love it. I'm going to sign one of these in pen, in your pen. Ooh, it flows really well too. Um, so April, that is signed with your pen. I'm going to set that one aside. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That is really awesome. Um, pens are one of my favorite things to get. Cool, different pens. So Yeah, we have a that. nice little display of them. Yes, we uh, have a display the of office. them in the office of all, all the interesting pens, particularly ones that are handmade. Mm -hmm. um, that's just an art that seems really fun. Um, and so, thank you, April. Um, and if you guys, you don't have to send me things, trust me, but uh, if you want to send fan mail, uh, we, we have uh, both the, pic the address up there, and we will be posting it um, on the, probably the... I can do it now? Yeah. At some point, it'll get posted. We'll post it multiple times, so... Um, anyway, let's go to another question, Adam. Uh, this one from Twitter from, mm -hmm. sorry for this mispronunciation, but Udi Kumra. Okay. Um, they say, you often talk about how you write sample chapters to discovery write your characters. Yep. What is the content of these chapters? Are these first chapters or interesting situations or something else? Each with a differently, uh, different personality swapped in. Um, so these are almost always first chapters. Once in a while, on a rare occasion, I do something that's not a first chapter, that's either kind of a monologue by the character or the character, you know, on an average day. But most of the time I want, if something really snaps and really works, um, I want to be able to use it in the book. Um, if you are curious about things like this, we have posted in the library on my website, we have posted the ones I did for Mistborn uh, with the various incarnations of Vin. Um, and we did, uh, we posted the ones for Skyward also, um, where I was really trying to find the voice and the right opening, uh, for Spencer in Skyward. Um, I don't have any of these for Stormlight Archive characters because I wrote an entire book doing this, um, which we will be releasing, um, to you guys. It's, we call it, I call it Way of Kings Prime. It's like, it's the version of Way of Kings I wrote in 2002 that is not... The, quite there. Not quite there. It is only like 20% of the way there of the book I wanted it to be. Um, but it's still readable. Um, and so we'll be releasing that in conjunction with the Kickstarter. Um, we've decided probably we're just going to give that out to free for free to everyone as part of the Kickstarter, kind of because it was going to be one of our, our rewards um, and things like that, that everyone who donated got it. But then this whole coronavirus thing hit and a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, and so we figured we would move that out of being one of the tiers and just give it away to everybody um, uh, once we launch the Kickstarter in early July is what we're looking at mm -hmm. right now. We probably are still doing that. That's for the leather-bound edition of the Way of Kings, the real version, uh, the published version, but you'll get Way of Kings Prime uh, given out as a free ebook in conjunction with that. So you guys can look forward to that. Uh, it is a fun book to read now that the book, the real book is good. Back in the day, I would not have wanted to share it with people because it was me stretching to write The Way of Kings without the skill to do it yet. And it was a grave embarrassment to me in many ways that it just did not work. Um, and there are so many elements of the story that became vital to it that aren't even in this version. Uh, like the spren, not there. Um, and so, yeah, bridge four, not there. So instead you have other things, um, like Kaladin training to be a swordsman, um, which is still fun, but anyway, 
Um, lots more Vasher um, in that version um, than in the published version, because I think he isn't even in the first book in the published version. So um, there you go. So uh, Oscar wants to know, um, are Herdazians based on Spanish or South American cultures? Mm -hmm. If so, thank you. They are really well made, uh, especially Lopin's mom and cousins, and the Lopin itself, of course. Yes. Um, so w I tend to use um, Earth cultures for inspiration. Um, I do try to make sure I'm not doing a one-to-one -one lift of an Earth culture um, for multiple reasons, but one of which being that, um, you know, Human beings, we creating something new is basically impossible to us, but we can re combine things r in really interesting ways. That's how our creativity works. Um, and so I look to a lot of Earth cultures. And uh, one thing I did notice is in, um, in epic fantasy, you see a lot of cultures inspired by various um, Asian cultures see a lot of, of course, European-inspired cultures. Um, you do not see very many Hispanic-inspired cultures. Um, and, of course, the Herdazians are not, again, a one-to-one -one correlation. I'm not trying to do that. Um, but um, I did want to use uh, that as some of the inspiration. It was tricky and dangerous because Lopen himself is such a goofy character. I didn't want to be like, I am implying that Hispanic people are crazy and goofy like the Lopen is. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that I feel is missing from a lot of stories that do try to represent a broad base of cultures and types of people and worldviews is that there's this growing sentiment that the only people who get to be really quirky and interesting um, are the ones that come from quote unquote safe places to borrow, right? Like, um, there's this fear that if you, if you put a black person in your book and you make them as quirky and goofy and interesting as, you know, a white character, that you will be really offensive. And you know what? That is super dangerous. Jar Jar Binks is a great example of why that is super dangerous. Um, and so I can understand the impulse to it, but what you end up with is this thing where instead of, you know, tokenism, you end up with like these characters that you're like, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to put a woman in my book, but I don't want to offend the women who read. So the woman in the book is just flawless. It's just perfect. I did this early um, in my unpublished career. Um, that's how I know you do it. It's this thing where you're like, I, I'm so worried that I'm going to get it wrong, that I'm just going to make this character perfect in every way. Um, and then they just completely lack depth. Um, and it's, on one hand, it's safe. And, you know, because you can really mess things up um, uh, this way. But on the other hand, you end up with these really dynamic, interesting, um, you know, male characters. And then you end up with all the women characters not being weak, not needing to be saved. You're, you've figured that part out. But then instead, they are um, all one note. These kind of perfect, badass, awesome, super characters. And I'm also aware of that. And so I decided, you know what? Lopen is Lopen. He's the character I want him to be. The way I make sure that I'm not making a statement I don't want to be making is I show that they... The, the Herdessens are a diverse culture with a lot of different people and a lot of different philosophies and a lot of different things. And the fact that Lopen is really out there, it just says that's, you know, in any culture, you can find your Lopens. And um, so that at least has been my goal. I, I hope I do that well. I know that, you know, I am in a dangerous area in the way that I do some of these things. But I think it is a dangerous area I want to be in because I think it makes for better storytelling when you do it right. Um, and so that's a long-winded answer to, yeah, Lopen is based off of Hispanic cultures. Or at least one of the inspiration to his cultures was, uh, was specifically um, Hispanic cultures. Um, and I know they are not a monolith, by the way. Um, and I was looking at Mexico uh, primarily. But I do have a lot of uh, friends from Bolivia. Um, and that inspired a bit too um so 
Eric uh, Molinette wants to know if you have a favorite literary trope that, to read in other people's books. I am a sucker for a thief with a heart of gold, if you can't tell um, from, um, from what I write and what I like to read. And a lot of my favorite characters are this kind of... Um, I mean, give me a thief with a heart of gold or give me a, a, a quirky jester character, right? Like the fool in, uh, in Robin Hobbs books. Like, I cannot get enough um, of that character. Um, just absolutely love reading those stories. So, yeah. Um, the things that you see me doing enough that I have to be careful not to do it in every book um, are the things that I do enjoy reading from other people as well. Uh, Salamadestron mm -hmm. Uh, says that they have one quick question. When querying a book, what advice do you have for writing the synopsis for the agents who want one? Oh, boy. Um, all right. So I am bad at this. Let's just give, give it to you straight. Um, because I am bad at it, I am not your best resource. Other people are better at this online, and you will find better resources. So the first thing I'll say is read widely about what other people say rather than looking to me because um, I hate synopses. I hate query letters. I was always bad at it. Uh, Robert Jordan, I heard in an interview once, um, someone asked him, um, I think this was one on one of his audiobooks. They had an interview at the end. They said, can you summarize your series? Or maybe he was talking about someone asking him this. And his response was, no, I wrote the books the length that I thought, the shortest I thought it was possible to tell that story. So that's the summary. Um, and there's a part of me that really empathizes with that answer. If he could have written it as a one-page synopsis, then that's what he would have written the books as. Um, it, that's not very helpful to you because the agents all want these things. Um, so here's a few things that my agent, when I asked him, um, specifically what he gave advice to people uh, along these lines. And he said, don't make it sound like a movie trailer um, for him. This is just one person's opinion. Uh, he said, if it asks too many rhetorical questions and if you can hear the booming movie theater trailer voice guy um, in his head, he starts to roll his eyes. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't have questions, but if it reads too much like um, like a movie trailer, he, he wants to know what the story actually is, uh, not what the back of the book flap summary is going to be, because you market that differently than you do to an agent. Agent just wants to know the actual type of story. Uh, he says, do give away your twists. Do give away your endings and those synopses. Not the back of the book one, obviously, but to the agents. That's what he recommends. He says, keep it brief. Um... Keep it in length that the agent has requested. Generally, there are kind of three lengths requests on this. One is just query, which means your summary has to be a paragraph, maybe too long. Then there's the synopsis slash outline, which I get varying answers to, but they're generally looking for, for a two to three pager. Um, and then there's uh, once in a while you want they ask for a proposal. Um, you won't get these as a new author very often, but a proposal is usually like a 10-page document um, uh, the, for a publisher that you're actually actively working with right now before they buy a book. Um, so two pages if they're asking for a synopsis, not just the query. Two to, two to three pages. Um, give away everything. Make sure you are, um, you can't get it all down in that page. So that make sure that you, the things you do get down, how can I say this? Oftentimes what I've heard is it's better to hit one idea of the book really well and show how it's developed through the course of the summary than to try to hit every single idea. Uh, the example I use of this is that Mistborn has two separate pitches you can make for it because Mistborn is both the story of the prophesied hero who failed to save the world, and now the story of the gaming thieves who are going to, you know, kind of try to fulfill those prophecies themselves by robbing the Dark Lord, right? Or it is the story of a young woman um, who is recruited kind of My Fair Lady way style and trained to be a thief slash imitate a noble woman um, uh, with the backdrop being this great heist. And those are two separate um, pitches and I would pick, uh, pick one of those for my summary to be my focus. Um, but once again, go read around online. Um, and the, there are lots of resources from agents themselves that they'll write about what they like as the perfect synopsis, the perfect 
um, query and these sorts of things. And they're going to do a better job of it than I will because I'm going to tell you, I did never sold anything off of a query or an outline. I broke in only through sample chapters. Every summary or query I sent out got rejected and I didn't get picked up until I found someone who read the actual sample chapters, the book that I sent. In fact, the person who picked me up, Moshe, I, he had asked for a full manuscript straight out rather than sample chapters and he's the person who picked me up because he had the entire novel and he read it in a couple of sittings, um, Elantris. Uh, and my writing was strong enough to speak for itself, but my summarizing was dreadful. Matthew Scouten uh, says, one of your characters shows up to your door and they know everything that's happened to them is your fault. Ooh. Who do you want it to be? Who would be the worst person for it Ooh. to be? Uh. <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> uh, oh, who is the worst person to show up on my door knowing it's my fault? Um. Oh, boy. Uh, oh, the team is all looking at me now, very curiously. Um, uh, <laughs> um, they are social distancing, by the way. They are all six feet apart, I can see. Um, worst. Best worst. and worst. Yeah, best and worst. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with worst first, um, not because it rhymes. Who is worst? Moash is worst, I think. Probably, um, right? Like it's, I, I, yes, terrible things have happened to a lot of my characters, but they, a lot of them are, are pretty decent people. And so I would feel sad, but I wouldn't feel danger for my life. There are some people that show up that would be, I would, yeah. I think Kaladin would still punch you. Kaladin probably punch me. Um, Hoyd would punch me, uh, for sure. So who is the best? Who do I most want to show up? Um, on my doorstep. Um, boy, have I written any stories where everything just went really well for somebody? Is there any short stories out there where, um, where nothing went wrong? I should write one just so I can answer questions like this. What's the, the guy at the Clear Lake? Oh, the Pure Lake guy. Oh, Pure Lake, yeah. Yeah, gonna... yeah, yeah, yeah. The new Relique guy. Yeah, um, I can't remember oh. his name. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He'd be a good one. He'd he, you know, he got he got magical fishes and uh, and maybe cat caught by a wife that he kind of wanted. He would be a good one to have show up. Um, yeah, he 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 wouldn't be bad. Axie's the collector would probably be fine. He he would we would just have a chat. Um, but bad luck follows him because of the curse of kind. So maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't want to be around Axie's the collector. He has, he is uh he's <clears throat> channeling the wrong kind of fortune. Let's just say that those are not. Uh, channeling is not an actual term. Don't take that and put it in the wiki. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, there we go. <clears throat> what's his name? What's the, what's the, what's the, nah, someone, someone will put it in the chat. Yeah, someone will put it in the chat. Yeah. I changed his name a couple times too. Um, all right. Seeing if it comes up in the stream. I'll it'll, give you another question. It'll come up. Mark's um, not around, so we don't have yeah. him answering it. He'd have it off the top of his head. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Ace Hire uh, mm -hmm. wants to know what uh, TV shows or movies you've been binging during the quarantine. Um, so, any. yeah. So let's, let's go down. So you guys are going to be so ashamed uh, of me. I never saw Arrival when it was out because um, when Arrival was out, it was like during a tour or something like that and I missed it in the theaters and I said I'm going to save this for the right time because I know I'm going to love it um, and so we I finally pulled it out and be like alright we, all, we are trapped here wife and I can't go on date nights to movies we're going to watch Arrival uh, and it was ex everything I had hoped and imagined that it would be um, it is so good uh, I like it a little better than the short story. I know that might be blasphemy, um, but you know, the short story is genius. So the movie being genius, uh, it's not a given, but the fact that it's genius in a slightly different way is really cool to me. Um, uh, I, I really liked Arrival. I didn't expect, well I did kind of, but I didn't expect them to be able to pull off both kind of some of the non-linearity alongside the cool uh, alien, stuff alongside great characterization so uh thumbs up 
what else have we watched? <clears throat> we watched um, we we watched the new Little Women, which was also incredible. Um, it was just really spectacular movie. Uh, we watched the new Emma. Uh, good, not as good as the Gwyneth Paltrow uh, one. That was where we came out. Though it's different enough, and they made some interesting different choices with the story to the point that I'm glad I watched it. And I would recommend, even if you really like the, um, the Gwyneth Paltrow one, to watch this one. Because the choices they make make it really an interesting movie to watch. And it is a good movie. It gets a thumbs up. Uh, we watched um, Onward, which um, I liked. Um, it Onward is a, is a tricky one because um, the core idea of the two brothers, I'll try not to give too many spoilers because this was new, but it's a basically brother-brother story that makes some interesting decisions narratively that I really appreciated. Um, it just did that really well. Uh, the whole fantasy in modern day aspect of it just never quite landed to me. Um, I'm not sure why, but it just, uh, it felt like the story didn't need it. And so it was kind of odd. Um, it's one of those things that I'm glad they tried, but I'm like, why? Why is this here? Um, it was not the best Pixar movie, but it's far from the worst Pixar movie. Uh, we watched Ford versus Ferrari, which, uh is as good as the reviews uh, say it is. Uh, it is perhaps the single most manly movie I've ever seen. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, I'll try not to give any spoilers, but there is literally a scene where a per man is dealing with crushing despair, and the way he comforts himself and, and cheers himself up is by sitting in a car and revving the engine and it is the sound just lulls him into happiness uh, again like that's the kind of movie that this is uh and it was it was very good it's very well acted um and very tightly um very tight narrative very well done um so yeah there's a few there's a few that we've seen i've lately like <clears throat> because of of this we've been just kind of looking for really good movies um, we haven't, I haven't seen any stinkers in a, in a while. Um, like the, probably the worst of the movies I've seen in the last few months was the new Jumanji. And it's still something I'd give like six, six and a half stars to. Um, it was still really fun. Um, so, um, yeah. Ishik. Of the Ishik, Gaelic. that's him. That's him. Yep. There he is. There he is. <clears throat> and, um, uh. Yeah, <clears throat> kind of a related good, question. Good to Harold, the... uh, or, or their derived name uh, there, so yeah. Um, uh, this one related to the, the question before. It says, oh, um, if there was one character in your worlds that you could bring into real life just to kick them in the shins and send them back, who would it be? Oh, kick them in the shins? Who am I going to kick in the shins? Hoyd. <laughs> Hoyd needs a good kicking in the shins. <laughs> uh, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one's from Peter Jordal. Says, mm -hmm. there's a strong undercurrent of religion and mental health in your books, from Legion to Stormlight. What drives you to write about these topics? Um, <clears throat> so what I am fascinated by leads to what I write about. Uh, and I am fascinated by the human experience, the way our minds work, um, the way different people perceive the world. I'm basically a writer because I want to explore how different people see the world. Like that, if you, <clears throat> we're going to take one, one reason I'm a writer and boil it down to the most core reason is that. I want to be another person for a while and try to figure out how they see the world. Um, religion is fascinating to me. I am a religious person and I want to see through the eyes who experience, of people who experience religion in different ways from me. Uh, that is one of the ways I understand the world and one of the ways that I understand religion better and uh, my own interaction with it is by being other people for a while and exploring how they see the world. Um, and I have a number of people who are very dear to me who experience mental health issues um, who see over and over when they are represented in fiction that the story, the story has to revolve around their mental health in a way that the story doesn't get to be anything else. And I know that gets really tiring to them. Um, beyond that, I know that this is a thing that a large segment of our population deals with. 
and then we don't really talk about in fiction unless it has to be a very special episode um, that deals with it, if you can understand what that means. Um, and so my fascination with the human brain, my fascination with our interaction with the divine, and my desire to see through the eyes of as many different people as I can is the reason I do almost everything I do, particularly related to these topics. A uh, fantasy fanatic uh, wants to know what the hardest part about writing a character of the opposite gender is. Um, right. So the hardest part, I would say, um, is getting yourself out of your own, um, your own ruts and the way you perceive the world um, and the way you perceive characterization. Uh, I've spoken this one many times, but the biggest hurdle I had to have... Oops, we just lost a pen here. So, Kara, uh, maybe you can send this to someone who sent us a fan mail. Yeah. Does right. that sound like a good idea? Instead of doing like a contest or something, then... Um, Do we want to send that one to the pen? Oh, yeah. Let's send this one to the... To, can you get, get, yes. get that one to the... To the, the pen, the pen person. Yeah. That seems like a good way to do these. Um, you know, not to incentivize. Yeah, don't a bunch don't of fan mail. don't don't send it just to get this. But we've been trying to find a way to give these out. Um, and so, and be, there are is enough fan mail that you are not guaranteed one. In fact, it's a very very unlikely that you will get one. But uh, that's how we'll do it. Uh, at least for for now. Um, there was a question there that just flew out of my brain. Did you ask one? Um, it was writing characters of the opposite Oh, yeah, gender. yeah, yeah. So the, the thing I've talked about is uh, early on, my biggest problem was that I wrote uh, characters to a role. And this isn't just characters of the opposite gender. It's anyone who wasn't the main character, particularly those characters who were very different from myself. Uh, your first instincts as a writer will be to use a, a character who is very similar to you. Uh, this is not necessarily a bad instinct. Write what you know. Um, in this case, lets you do... One character that you don't have to stress about as much in some of your early books may mean that that book doesn't need to get published because um, if you're writing a character just like yourself, there are other big uh, problems and pitfalls you'll fall into. But regardless, all the other characters in my books I wrote to roles. And so a lot of the women in my books were the love interest, quote unquote. And because of that, they did not have their own goals, motives, and story. They existed to exist in someone else's story. Um, that hurdle goes for um, most new writers can get some advice on that one. Uh, one of your other instincts will be what I talked about a little bit earlier um, with, um, with um, you know, writing women who are um, strong female characters taking that to heart and writing them so strong that they aren't a character. Um, this actually happens both to male writers and female writers in that a lot of times you will write your main character as this very quirky individual with all sorts of interesting things happening to them and uh, really flawed, interesting flaws. And then to balance that, you will write the love interest, the opposite gender character um, in most books, not always, but you will often write the love interest being someone who is a good foil for this character. So this love interest person will become the responsible, um, stoic, um, you know, um, straight character. Uh, again, not necessarily by orientation. That's just, you know, um, by, uh, by narrative, um, uh, by narrative convenience or narrative, narrative description, the straight character. Um, and because of that, you'll end up with a lot of your romantic interests being boring. Um, and you will notice this in romance novels of men and, um, um, you will notice it, women writing men and men writing women, um, and so ask yourself, what, is, what makes this character really interesting? What, what is their passion? What is their goal? What do they want to get out of life? What would they be doing if the plot had not come along and clobbered them like it's going to do in your story? Who are they and what do they want out of life? Remember that everyone is the protagonist of their own story, inevitably. Um, so yeah, that I think will be a help to you listening to people is 
one of the most vital skills you can develop as a writer. Um, going and listening to accounts by people. Uh, if you're trying to write someone different from yourself, you will often be able to find blogs or um, panels at conventions where people say, <clears throat> Get up and talk about what everyone gets wrong about X. You know, doctors, what do, does everybody get wrong about your profession? Um, that sort of thing can be really handy to read about. Um, and ask yourself the whys. Like, what? put yourself in their shoes. And this is a vital skill to learn as a writer. It is really handy to practice. All right, we're going to do some fan mail. Um, this one comes from, uh, from Spencer um, and... Um, Spencer, um, I appreciate the kind words you said in this letter. Uh, we've boiled it down to the question you asked. So I'm going to ask your question. Will Calden and Kelsier ever meet? Will they get along if they did meet? Even if they don't meet, I'm fascinated by the possibilities of a misfort and a windrunner could create by working together. Um, so whether they'll actually meet or not is a raffo. Thank you for the fan mail, by the way. Um... Raffle means read and find out. Not, I won't explain any more than that on that line. I do not think they would get along very well. Um, Kelsier, it takes a very special type of person to get along well with Kelsier. Um, though you will, I promise, see Wind Rain Runners and Alamancers interact. Uh, technically, you already have because Hoyt is, a, is an Alamancer, but that's not what you're asking about. You will see large clashes between various different magic systems in the future of the um of the cosmere all right so uh sarah sarah i've got a question from sarah um who um let's see sarah went to disneyland and um they <laughs> they kept themselves um entertained on the drive home by imagining what various sanderson's characters would do they got to spend a day at disney at a disneyland park and we have an entire list from Sarah. Um, I'm going to read a few of Sarah's here uh, to you guys, um, and then maybe I'll, uh, I'll say a few of myself. Ellen appreciates that Vin agrees that all the souvenirs are too expensive, but does make sure to buy one her one present. Is glad he brought a book to read when Alrian steals, Alrian steals Vin. Yes, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, let's see. What would Wayne do? Tries the the whole pin trading thing, but doesn't quite do it right. Also, <laughs> yeah, he ends up with all the pins. Um, also spends a lot of time in the hat section of the gift shops. Ah, uh, nice one. Rock tries all the food so she can make new and improved copycat recipes that include some shells later. Um, that's that's very nice. Um, well, who do, who do you want me to do, um, Adam, uh, at Disneyland? Which 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 of the characters? Oh, um, the Lord Ruler. Lord Ruler at Disneyland. Lord Ruler at Disneyland. Uh, Lord L Ruler at Disneyland um, <clears throat> declares that there must be some nefarious mind behind this entire diabolic operation and decides to, to liberate everyone from that, that diabolic uh, mind. Um, and it does not go well. With spikes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Few more spikes. Oh, so, hey, Sarah, that is, that is a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for sending that. Um, glad that I could keep you entertained around your Disneyland, uh, or, uh, Disney World. I didn't read which one it was. Probably Land. I think Disneyland. Um, so. Uh, this one from Team Cantor. All right. Says, uh, how did reading Pratchett affect your writing? And they want to know if you have a favorite quote from Pratchett. Um, let's see. My favorite Pratchett quote is probably, uh, teach a man to build a fire and he'll stay warm for one night set him on fire and he'll stay warm for the rest of his life um which uh <laughs> just so perfect <laughs> um uh what did how did pratchett change my writing um i don't know uh everything you read will change your writing in some way one of the things i love about pratchett is his books are so different from the way that i write books that I can read them without so much of an analysis brain going on, asking, how did he do this? Could I do this or could I do that? I just read them and say, this is a completely different art form from what I do, and that lets me enjoy it uh, on kind of a, the level I used to enjoy books on. A lot of books I enjoy on a different level, which I appreciate and really like, 
um, right now, but uh, I don't enjoy them like I used to, which is kind of just the pure enjoyment of being wrapped up in the story. And uh, Pratchett, I can just read and enjoy for that reason. Um, I do not think I would ever try to write a Pratchett-esque book. Um, I don't think I am up to writing a Pratchett-esque book, but I don't feel bad for that because I don't think very many people in the world are up to writing a Pratchett-esque book. There may have only been one, um, but yeah. Uh, if you guys have not read Terry Pratchett, uh, please give it a try. Again, it's it's British humor, so it could... I can conceive of some person out there not enjoying it, um, but it's very a very hard thing for me to conceive. Um, do not start with The Color of Magic, which is the first Discworld book. Uh, this is the one piece of advice that every Discworld fan I've talked to uh, agrees upon. I'm sure there are dissenting opinions out there, but... Um, I would recommend starting with Guards, Guards, um, or The Truth, which is my personal favorite. Um, or I, I have successfully gotten uh, people into Pratchett by giving them Monstrous Regiment, which is Pratchett's take on the young woman dresses like a man to go to war um, myth. Um, and, um, Pratchett has a very, very fun interpretation of that story, which is already a f story rife for amusing, uh, interactions. And if I remember correctly, your favorite is going postal, correct? My favorite is probably going postal. Nightwatch is probably... If I had to say what is the absolute best Pratchett book, it's Nightwatch. Um, you can't appreciate Nightwatch without reading the earlier Guards books because it's in the Guards sequence. But I think if they, if you have to pick one opus for Pratchett, it is Nightwatch. My favorite is Going Postal. Um, just because the brings up the trope. Po Going Postal is about a rogue with a heart of gold. Um, though his might be more like a heart of copper. Uh, he's just put in the right situation where he can polish that copper really nicely. Um, but regardless, um, it's about a man named Moist von, von Lipwick, who is a petty thief who gets caught. And his punishment is he has to take over the post postal service in the city and make it run. And if he doesn't, he'll be executed. Um, so, <laughs> um, This one from a name I can't read. Says, I found your works to be highly enjoyable as audiobooks, whereas some authors I get lost in their audiobooks. Hmm. Do you consider the audio adaptation when you write, or is this a happy accident? Uh, it's a happy accident, though I read, quote unquote, a lot of audiobooks, and so they have left a big effect on me. And so there's going to be some very um, subconscious things that I do because of that. Um, so, but it is a happy accident. I. Would hope that a little bit of that is the, the readers that we choose because we are very deliberate about the readers we choose for my audiobooks because I happen to like audiobooks. Adam happens to really like audiobooks. In fact, most of my team has some lot of experience with audiobooks, and so we work very hard to make our audiobooks really good. Um, Liza wants to know, um, what are good ways to fill time passing between plot points when you can't or don't want to write, quote-unquote, two weeks past two weeks past if you don't want to write two weeks past you are going to have to find some signifier um now a lot of ways most of the time what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to to do a pitch and a catch right you're going to want to have chapter say you know you're you know that there's a time jump between chapter five and chapter six and so what you do is in chapter five you say man i've got to get ready for the ball um, I only have two weeks to get ready or whatever. You know, I've got to get ready for the ball. It's coming up. You don't have to give a deadline on it. But then the next chapter you say, the night of the ball, I... And you've, you've basically given your setup um, and your catch and the reader, therefore, will be in line and step with you. And that does work better than two weeks past um, anyway. Uh, if you can do that, it just keeps momentum in your story. It's this whole idea of promises and progress and fulfillment of promises and even little promises like that work really well for keeping a reader engaged and for moving through a story. Um, if you're not going to do that, you're going to have to show time passing in another way, um, which is kind of the, you know, uh, in one chapter you have visited this one place and in the next chapter you visit again and things have noticeably changed. The roses have bloomed. There is dust on the mantle despite being dusted last time. Um, you use these visual narrative cues 
to tell us time has passed. Um, and that can work really well. Um, but uh, you, you are going to have to modulate this based on the story that you're telling and the genre of story you're telling. The key important thing is to make sure that readers aren't lost. Um, and if as long as you do that, you're going to be okay. Uh, Micah Clark wants to know or get some tips for writing fight scenes. Uh, writing fight scenes. All right. So... Um, I linked a YouTube video um, that um, talks about writing great fight scenes uh, in part because it takes me to task on some things I've said that it was right that I got wrong. Um, and so if you can find that one, it's back in my Twitter feed and things like that. It's a YouTube video about writing great fight scenes. I think that whole video is really on the mark. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that... Um, you should play to your strengths as a writer and to the strengths of the medium you're using to tell your story. Uh, that means if we are using prose novels to tell our story, um, we are going to have certain strengths that other mediums don't have, and leaning into those is going to be handy for writing a fight scene. What are our strengths? We can show direct character emotion and thoughts in a way that films just cannot um and even comic books we can do more of it because we have more words what we can do in a fight scene is that we can very easily connect character motivation with character actions and give a sense of progress through a scene um, a great fight scene in a book often has markers of progress that are happening happening through the course of the fight and has its own narrative flow meaning beginning middle and end within that middle escalation of stakes or escalation of danger in some way um or uh changing and reassessing of goals Showing a character going into a fight wanting one thing, realizing halfway through they need another thing. Raising the stakes because they have now been fighting for a while and that other thing has been getting further and further from their grasp is something that works really well in a novel. Uh, what you want to avoid, and where I got taken to task by this YouTuber who was correct, is blow by blows tend to be boring um, in any situation i may i said that blow by blows were were fat were fun in visual mediums and not in books and the youtuber is correct they're boring everywhere right um and um if you want to tell a great fight blow by blow is not the way to go another rhyme uh instead you want to show the character's progress the character achieving things the char character leveling up or leveling down right um, trying things and failing, it should be progressing the plot, the character, um, in, in some way, plot or character, ideally both, um, and it should have its own mini sequence of, like I said, beginning, middle, and end with goals and changes in goals and things like that. Um, one easy trick is to, um, don't overuse it, is to say there are this many bad guys and the fight ends when they're down and show the character being pushed more and more to their limits as they are trying to, to deal with all of these different forces fighting against them uh, to bring it to a natural conclusion of do they win or lose at the end. So, uh, But look for, look for ways you can give a sense of progress. Readers love progress. This is like one of the key ideals for telling great stories is to know that as a reader... Most of us want to be able to feel like there is motion going on through the narrative, not just from where the characters are going. And that motion should give us a sense of progress toward an ending um, in some way. Um, Dora wants to know, uh, what reaction to a character surprised you the most? Uh, what character were you surprised to see such love or hate for? Ooh. Hmm. This is... Uh, this is... I'm going to have to dig back um, a little bit because these days I run such extensive beta reads and I have for quite a while that beta reader reactions can definitely surprise me, right? But by the time the book comes out, it's much more rare for me to be surprised. 
Um, I was not prepared for how much people would jump on the, uh, the main bag bandwagon with things like the stick. Uh, I should have been prepared for that because I was part of Wheel of Time fandom and I was there for Narg. Um, and so I know how things can become a meme even in the uh, early days of the internet and they become memes much faster nowadays. Um, but what re reaction? Early on when I released the launchers, here's, here's probably the best example of this. Um, I was not yet prepared for the idea that people would latch onto one character to the point that any other viewpoint taking them away from that character would make them resent that character to an extent. And this is just kind of a natural thing of using multiple viewpoint books. A lot of times, readers will come to resent a character, not because they dislike that character, but because that character keeps them from the character that they like more. Um, so while there are people who legitimately hate um, one given character in a Elantris, um, more often it is that people really connect with one character and dislike the other characters for taking them away from it. And most of the time, uh, because his plot is the, the most dynamic, people are connecting with Rayodin and wanting to know what happens next with Rayodin. And so they pick either Serene or Raithen to really dislike as keeping them away from getting more, um, more Rayodin. Um, and this was kind of a learning experience in me. To one extent, I, don't, I think it's inevitable. To another extent, you can do things to mitigate it um, through writing your stories by the way that you, where you're cutting your story so that you're not leaving a great cliffhanger to go to a character who's not doing something dynamic or interesting and then staying with them a long time. Um, I kind of mixed my, my negatives and positives. So what you do want to do is make sure if you're going to cut to another character that either you are not cutting from a really powerful cliffhanger or if you are, you are making sure that what the other character is doing is kind of a, an equally tonal um, match to that and that you get back quickly. Um, what I try to do, for instance, in the Stormlight Archive is I try to use different characters to balance each other. So basically, this is uh, most evident in the first Way of Kings where Kaladin is in a really dark place through the opening half of that book. Um, and... Um, because of this, Shallan slash Dalinar exist, um, you know, for their own narratives and things, but I made sure when I wrote their scenes that there were, they were lighter. What was going on in the, their stories was not as oppressively, emotionally, um, heart-wrenching as what was going on with Kaladin, so that you got to relax from Kaladin with Shallan or Dalinar rather than to feel like they were stealing you away from what was a really, really interesting story. And I often, if I'm going to cut at a cool cliffhanger, these days I try to just put the next chapter in right then, rather than going to another character and coming back. Um, this all goes out the window during the, the Sander Lanch at the end of one of my books, where everything goes crazy and all the viewpoints mix. Um, but hopefully that is, uh, that is still working because theoretically really interesting things are happening with everybody and I'm cutting quickly enough back and forth between them that you don't have time to feel like you're missing out or to resent a character before you go back. Man, that was a long-winded answer, wasn't it? There's an epic <laughs> fantasy answer for you to a simple question. Um, Byron wants to know if there are any Magic the Gathering cards you're still looking for. Mm. Uh, yes, Byron, but I do not want you to give me one uh, because... Um, what I'm missing right now um, is uh, a beta lotus to replace my unlimited lotus. <laughs> um, and I am fully capable of buying my own beta lotus. I'm baiting out all of my, um, all of my power for my cube, and I'm about halfway done. Um, and so I'm still looking for that, but I would rather you not send me one of those. Even if, by some odd reason, you are independently wealthy and want to, I would just feel too guilty. Uh, for that, because I'm fully capable of buying one, um, and I will. Um, otherwise, am I looking for anything specific? Um, I would love to get my hands on a foil Spanish Soren Lord of Innistrad, because in Spanish, Soren Lord of Innistrad is Soren 
El Señor, <laughs> Del Innistrad. And that is just cool, right? The Señor of Innistrad. Um, like, tell me that's not really cool, right? It's like, fun, for sure. That is just cool. Um, and so there are some foreign language ones. Like, there are some cards that are just really cool in foreign languages. Um, that, like, I want to get the Liliana that was painted by, um, what's his name, Anato? Um, the Final Fantasy artist. Uh, they did a Japanese version of her uh, that is just gorgeous because he is such a fantastic artist. Um, but those are really expensive too, so don't send me one of those. But you know, there, there's stuff like that um, that I'm that I'm looking for that I that someday I will I will end up uh, picking up. Um, and so yeah. Um, Isabella uh, wants to know what your secret is. Uh, to finding your way back into a world and its characters after a long pause, like with Wax and Wayne or Stormlight. Um, how do you keep the style and the characters consistent? This is an excellent question. This sounds like a question that, uh, from a writer because it is one of the hidden problems with writing that I did not anticipate that is much more difficult than I thought it would be. Uh, this is worst when you're in the middle of a story and you have to stop for a revision of something else and then come back to it. That can be killer. Um, it, to the point that it was easier for me because I had written uh, half of Shadows of Self and had to stop to do revisions on a Stormlight book, came back about a year later because I had other things that had to be done, and it was easier for me to get back into Wax and Wayne by writing the sequel, Bands of Mourning, and then jumping back because jumping into the middle of a story is just so tough. Um, so my tips and tricks are, number one, try to arrange your life so you don't end a story halfway through. Uh, that is just, I, I've tried really hard to do that. Um, I guess you don't end, just to leave it halfway done. Um, the other thing is I have tried to learn to get two sequels promptly because the longer you let a sequel wait, the harder it is to come back to the, to the series. <clears throat> Rhythmatist. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, the, the third thing is I often will go back and reread the book before, uh, taking notes about things that I would like to make sure happen in the book, in the, the series going forward. Um, and that is the only tip that uh, if you can't, are in the middle of something, going back. Uh, also really handy, if you do have to leave a story half done, um, writing yourself a big, long explanation of what you were going to do in the very next chapters uh, can be really handy. In the same way, when you finish a book, writing out a, a part of the outline for the sequel um, can be really handy for you when you're coming back to it. Uh, Carol loves books. Uh, I do too. <laughs> says, is the progress of your work influenced by this crisis? And are you distracted, or is the situation good for your creativity? Yeah, um, so the way my my personal psychology works, um, this has not influenced it dramatically. Um, I know that some people who are very close to me are really anxious about it, and it's made it hard for them to work. Um, that is, fortunately in this case, not how my uh, personal psychology works. Um, I mostly, uh, for this... Um, looks like part of these are backward, but not all of them. So I flip around for a little while and then flip back. Um, for me, this honestly got me out of a lot of trips that I had to do um, for various uh, publicity uh, promises I've made to the publishers and just earned me more time. And uh, that is really nice. And... Um, Beyond that, um, so in the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, we don't pick when our church is. Uh, we're just kind of, we rotate through uh, different church groups, sometimes have church uh, starting at 9 a.m. and sometimes have church starting at noon. And this has always been a part of my life. I'm totally fine with it. I have made this decision myself. But when 9 a.m. church rolls around, that is a year where once a week I got to get up after like three hours of sleep, uh, which I don't love. And the coronavirus decided to happen right in the middle of 9 a.m. church year. Um, and we are all having now, you know, church just with our families uh, and not going out to church. And man, though I would not wish 
this uh, this coronavirus on anyone, and I am super sad that it's happening. I don't have to get up early <laughs> on Sundays, and I really kind of like that. So, um, so yeah, plus, this is really cool. Um, these are all the silver linings, by the way. I do not like the, the, the coronavirus is here, but silver lining is my wife going a little stir crazy, a little bit anxious. This was the perfect time. She has never really ever been a gamer, and I got her addicted to Animal Crossing. Yes, for the first time in her life, she is legitimately addicted to a game, um, and she is playing a video game on our Switch. Like, this is revolutionary. Like, my three children are mega gamers, and I'm a mega gamer. And my wife has always, you know, she's always been as understanding as she can be, not having been a gamer. Um, and so she will say things like, well, go play your game for a half hour. And I'll try to explain to her that Joel and I are doing like the Halo, we just did the Halo campaigns. And I'll, we can't guarantee it's going to be done in an hour. Some of these take 45 minutes, right? And stopping a mission in the middle while technically possible, just not something you're going to do, right? Um, and she doesn't quite get that and never has gotten that. But now she takes the switch and disappears for two hours. And she's like, that was two hours? I'm like, yes, this is how it is playing a great video game. Now you understand why your children are like, that wasn't that wasn't half hour. I, you know, that was only five minutes. So anyway, Animal Crossing. Uh, thank you, Animal Crossing, for making a game that my, my wife loves. Um, and, uh, I am, I am very much enjoying this, that situation. Yeah. As soon as I heard you got it, or as yeah. soon as I heard Emily got it, I went out and bought it for Jane so they yep. could oh, yeah? do something, but she hasn't started playing. Well, she's, she's, she's start probably playing. playing it now. I got it for her last night. Cause we need to get the other fruits, right? So you, you only get two fruits per Island and there's like six of them. Mm -hmm. And so, or five. Um, and so, you know, we need to, we need to get, find someone who has apples. We don't have apples. No, that's, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what we have. Yeah. You got apples? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You also got to watch and see what your turnips sell for okay. so that we can come sell turnips on your island in case okay. the turnips sell for a good price. I've only played for like 45 minutes, mm -hmm. so I yeah. don't even know half of the mm -hmm. stuff you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Anyway, mm. now that we're done with our little Animal Crossing discussion, yes. um, Jason Kalau says, um, as a writer, what are your feelings of altering characters, race, and gender when adapting? for TV or movies. Uh, against uh, it? Yeah. Oh, against it? They were specifically asking for like Wheel of Time and stuff like that. Oh, for Wheel of Time? Yeah. Um, I am generally going to be against this um, because normally what's happening is they're wash-washing the characters, right? Like, mm. um, like normally they are taking books that are more diverse and they are making them not as diverse and there is a problem in hollywood with like uh i guess i'm thinking prince of, of persia yeah prince of persia but even even like when i've we've talked about doing stormlight they are really resistant to casting asian characters in the main roles uh in hollywood this has just been a hard thing to get across to them um i think there are situations where it is appropriate depending on the property um like um like I know this is probably a bad example because it's a terrible movie, but I know a lot of people were up in arms about Aang being cast as a Caucasian character, but that a lot of the fandom said, no, he's kind of supposed to be. Like, he is, this is, this is who he is. But then they also recast, what, Katara and her brother as white characters when they weren't supposed to be and are very clearly not. And it's like, hey, you're, it's, like, that is just insulting, right? Um, I am totally fine with it in the instance of the Wheel of Time. Uh, the reason is specifically with the Wheel of Time, what's going on is Robert Jordan really wanted to build a society that indicated that our world what is this same world many thousands of years in the future. And he wanted to have metropolitan cities have become rural areas again over time like this sort of this regression from giant city into um into rural countryside he also as a main theme 
Oh, do we have another one of these? A main theme in the Stormlight Archive, or not Stormlight, uh, the Wheel of Time, is this idea that culture is more important than race to the people in the Wheel of Time world. They are very, very biased toward one another based on nationalism. Nationalism is a huge thing, but not based on um, skin color. And so because of this, the changes to say make the two rivers have black people in it works really well with robert jordan's world building and with the theme of the story he's trying to do um plus i am generally in favor of diversifying stories rather than you know um the other way around that is a political leaning of mine i understand that people have arguments against this and I can understand those arguments, right? I can understand the argument of you should not have changed the, the races, the characters, and the Wheel of Time. This is going contrary to, you know, this is, how should we say? The best arguments against I've said is saying, you know, if you're looking for diverse stories to tell, find diverse stories that were written that way and adapt those. It's a pretty good argument, right? Um, I can't fault people for saying, like, why buy the Wheel of Time and then do this? Why, if you want to do this, not buy a story that already was like this? I think in the instance of the Wheel of Time, it makes perfect sense. And having met the actors, they are perfectly cast to the characters. Um, and so kind of having a race-blind casting process in that case just really worked out. So, um, but, you know, like I said, I can see arguments on that. I, it just really... It, uh, it, the place that it's hit me is that, you know, I have written some stories that star mostly what we would call on Earth, you know, uh, Caucasian, white characters, right? And I'm totally fine with those, those stories being adapted with that, type, you know, cast. They all come from the same country. That makes sense. Um, but Stormlight Archive... Getting such resistance on that really, really bugged me. Um, they're like, what if we cast this character? I'm like, that's great, but that character's not Dalinar because that's not how Dalinar looks. So anyway, um, you, caught, you, you hit a nerve there, let's just say. Well, let's go to a lighter note. Yes, lighter uh, This note. one from Robert uh, mm -hmm. Jutza says, if these characters would somehow meet in a battle, who would win, in your opinion? Okay. And if you could be one, who would you choose? And they give three different hypothetical scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is Superman versus Thor. Superman versus Thor. Um, so I'm going to side on Superman um, on this one. Just kind of looking at the definition of the, own, the character's <coughs> mythoses, though it is going to depend on... You know, which Thor, or which, you know, where Thor is um, in his various incarnations and things like that. But I'm going to go Superman. I go Superman. Cool. Uh, the next one um, is Vin versus Arya Stark. Vin versus Arya Stark. <sighs> so Allomancy versus yeah. face changing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, this is, this is going to play into... <sighs> this one gets tougher because the... If, if, if Vin met Arya on the battlefield, straight up fight, Vin wins, right? Vin has superpowers to an extent that just don't exist um, in the in Westeros, right? I mean, Vin is a superhero, and those don't exist, really, um, there. Um, Arya comes from a way more ruthless setting, right? Um, like, you've got to give her some points, for the fact that the the god of her world versus the god of my world is just way more ruthless than I am. And that gives Arya some points. So if they're not meeting meeting on the battlefield, I might have to give this one to Arya. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, Vin is, is pretty sneaky. Vin grew up on the streets. Vin comes from the worst background I am willing to write into one of my books. But on a George Martin scale, the worst background I'm willing to write in my books is probably like a four. And, you know, Arya comes from a ten. So, yeah. Uh, and the next one is Gandalf versus Yoda. Gandalf versus Yoda. Gandalf. Yeah. Um, though, in the, the, the Yoda now has powers that if he's dead, it doesn't really <laughs> matter. Um, but Gandalf comes back from the dead, too. And he mm. comes back stronger. So... 
Uh, Gandalf is uh, essentially a demigod, right? Um, and Yoda is great and wise, and Yoda would probably... My Yoda would not fight Gandalf. Um, Gandalf would probably fight Yoda if he had to. So, there you go. Uh, let's see. Um, how would you pull off a main uh, point of view character that is already a master at the magic system or of the magic system? Oh, how that's a, that's a good question. Um, so this can work really well. Um, I was handed Randall Thor when he was as a, a fairly masterful character in uh, his magic system. So I've actually I've done this. Um, I would say understand that what the character can't do despite you know their strong powers is often the source of where your story is going to be um make sure that they are still allowed to show off their competence right writing a character who is a master of their magic shouldn't really be too much on the base core structural sense different from writing a character who is a master spy or a master swords person or something like this, right? Um, this is a character who has a competence. And watching competent characters be competent has a certain level of just strength to it that, um, that, is, that is fascinating and that we enjoy. Um, writing a story that challenges um, James Bond's espionage abilities despite him being a master of espionage is still it's hard but it still is a really great story um granted the he's not yet a master and has to learn to be a master is also a really great story and is made probably the best story of this current incarnation but there are lots of great james bond stories so you gotta ask yourself you know number one make sure there are things that the character can't do with their magic that are still relevant to the story but also make sure you know, their competence comes into play. Um, and um, make sure that using that magic is interesting. Uh, this, is, this is a key thing. Um, because we are going to get derive a lot of our enjoyment from this hypothetical story that you are suggesting um, from um, the character using their magic in competent ways. And if you haven't designed your magic to be really interesting, it's going to be a problem. Because a story about a character learning to use the magic can get by on this idea that learning is fascinating. Growing, growth is a natural progression. Even if the magic using it itself is not as visually interesting, that's okay because watching the character become better at it is its own reward. But once the character's already good at it, that magic's got to be really cool to watch, quote unquote, to read about and to be in their head as they use. So make sure it's got visual components, make sure there's problem solving involved in using this magic, make sure that it requires effort and interesting skill from the person using it in ways that you can show on the page in a way that are interesting. Um, I should do uh, fan mail because I did finish one um, and then uh, didn't do a fan mail. So uh, this is for from Brianna. Brianna, thank you for this. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have some fan art. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what this is. It says, um, it's got this character doing this. And it says, I am a hand fan, not a mutant watermelon, a writer, not an artist. Um, and so... Um, Let's see. I'm your biggest fan? No, literally. In training, uh, Vivina practiced on me, commanding me to become silent. Um, so, um, this is, uh, wow, this is really interesting. This is written from the viewpoint um, of a uh, um, a sentient fan who wanted to tell a new type of story with his fan fiction. Um, and so, um, she's writing about herself in the third person and that I have helped her to become a writer. So I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you for getting your mother to read Warbreaker. Um, so, um, <laughs> this is really cool. I have no idea what to make of it. Um, but this is really cool. Thank you so much, Brianna. 
Uh, thank you for the wacky piece of art. Um, and I hope that you have a wonderful time writing. You're obviously very creative. I will sit down and read that, uh, that uh, fan mail in depth after this. Um, but thank you. Uh, this next one is from Alex Wylings. Uh, they say your original five part tour pitch when they first signed you, mm-hmm. um, you posted three on the blog way back in the day Elantris, Mistborn, and Oath Shards. What were the other two, and can we see them? Oh boy. What? What did I. I did Oath Shards. Is that what I called Stormlight Archive um, oh. before it was Stormlight Archive? That probably was. It makes it, sense. Yeah. Um, that might have been what I what I pitched them as the name of the series. Um, I only vaguely remember that. What else did I pitch to Tor? The, you're, we're stretching back 20 years now. Um, man. Man. What else did I pitch to them? I have no idea. I literally have no idea. It was probably Dragonsteel, would be my guess, um, because of that and probably White Sand. Um, it would have been two other Cosmere books, so the only other one is Aether of Night, um, and I didn't really have any other big Cosmere books planned in my head other than those at that point. I've since added the Threnody novel, um, but that's a, a newer thing, um, and so probably that, man... Uh, I have no idea. Yeah. So the answer to can you see them? Mm-hmm. Maybe. If it's White Sand, you can sign up for Brandon's newsletter and get yes. it that way. If you want to read Aether of Night, you can get that uh, requested through 17th Shard. Yep, 17th Shard, just give that away. Dragon Steel, we will avenge- reveal eventually. Um, it is not that good. Um, so I'd really rather have written a good version, and then you guys can go back and, back and read the bad version after the good version is out. But we'll see. Um, Justin Meyer wants to know how you keep yourself from wandering down the world building extravaganza. Wandering down the world building extravaganza, meaning, um, getting the, uh, how do I handle getting world builders disease? Yeah. Um, right. How do I avoid world builders disease? So, um, so for me, it helps to have deadlines, right? Like you can't have world builders disease if you have set a self-imposed or an externally imposed deadline to get a book done by a certain time. Um, that teaches you to be very um, careful with how you spend your world building time. Um, the other thing that helps me with world building disease is to know that I'm going to write lots of books and all the cool ideas that I want to do that can't fit in uh, this world, I'm going to be able to do books using those ideas eventually. Um, and so keeping myself focused and not saying, well, I want to world build this and world build this and world build this. I'm like, no, 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 no. If you want to make a really cool language, you're going to be writing a Elantris eventually. You can make a language-based magic system that will be really useful in that one. How about for this book, we instead spend our time world building the religion because that's what's going to be actually relevant. Um, or to tell ourselves, you know, I am going to write a three book series out of this and I'm going to, ahead of time, world build enough that I can write the first book very competently. And then I can spend time world building on the places that felt sparse in that first book and revise the first book before it has to be turned in to now have the depth of world building that I want it to. But I can't know what that is until I've written the book. I can't know for sure where I'm gonna need that world building time. It is very easy to go back and add more lore and world building in during a revision. Um, You are best off in your first draft, keeping your story lean and focused, and that's gonna generally serve you better. So those are just kind of mindsets that have helped me. Uh, Kareen Kumar uh, wants to know what it was like for you when you first got Robert Jordan's notes on the Wheel of Time. Oh, man. So I told this story before, but I got Robert Jordan's notes. uh, What was the day? It was like December 7th or something like that. Uh, It's the day that the interview I did with Dragon Mount went live. Um, I had just flown to Charleston, uh, first time in Charleston, got to visit Robert Jordan's house, um, has the, the dragon symbol from the, um, from the, the tops of the chapters on the gates to the house. Uh, got to meet Harriet, who's a legend in the business. 
And it was late, and I walked in the door, and Harriet said, would you like some dinner? I have some, you know, I have some soup that I, that I, that I had earlier. And I said, actually, I'd like the ending, please. And she's like, oh, of course. And I sat just in the living room there with the printed out notes that were the ending of the Wheel of Time, and just myself, because uh, it was kind of late uh, when Harriet picked me up, and she went up uh, to bed. And I just sat there and read through those notes for a couple of hours. And it was a really solemn occasion, right? Um, very reverent occasion. It's like, uh, um, you know, like reading a new book of scripture that you have never had before that has just been handed to you. I don't want to put that much emphasis on it, um, but you know, I've been reading The Wheel of Time since I was 14 or 15, and um, I knew that this, what was in these notes was going to dominate my life for at least half a decade. Um, and derail my career entirely with my own blessing. Um, and so it was quite the kind of solemn moment um, with me being able to read through all of that to see what I actually had to work with uh, for the ending and to see Robert Jordan's own ending. So uh, that, was, that was what the scene was. It's one of those scenes that's burned into my mind. I can still smell what the house smelled like, feel the cushion of the chair, um, uh, underneath me as I sat in that room. It's very, very perfect and clear and burned into my head. Um, you know, it's like that moment when I found out about 9-11, right? There are just things that get burned into your memory. And that was one for me. Um, Kelly um, says, you mentioned once upon a time that you had an idea for a book based on certain viruses, bacteria, illnesses, giving characters powers. Yep. Has the current crisis of COVID-19 <laughs> given you any new ideas or inspiration for said idea to blossom and build on? It has. It definitely has. Um, and it's been really kind of helpful for that, uh, that reason. I think I'm more likely to write Silence Divine than I've ever been before. Uh, but... I've learned to have to really be careful to curtail my um, my side projects, particularly when a Stormlight book is due. And a Stormlight book is due on July 1st. Um, and that is creeping up real quickly. And I actually got an email from someone today um, that just is begging me to release Rhythm of War now while, while they're trapped in quarantine because they need something to read. Um, if by some chance you, a uh, person who sent me that email, um, are watching, the book's just not ready. I can't release it. It's not done. I'm not holding it back from you because, um, you know, I'm, I'm cruel or because, you know, like th these books, we go right to the deadline on these books. And this book will be turned in like the hour that it is required to be turned in uh, and not before. The last hour it can be turned in and still be printed and shipped um, is when we will turn the book in. And so um, there's just lots to do uh, going through all the beta reader comments now. And while several of the plot lines work just fine, there's some of the plot lines that need some work. Um, and you're going to be a much happier person with this book with me doing that. So I cannot uh, stop and write um, Silence Divine right now. I got to keep my eye on the goal, my eyes. Um, Naomi is wondering if you're going to do a sequel for Warbreaker, but I thought you might just like to yeah. talk about yep. sequels. Sequels. Status. Well, you know, you know. Status sequels. You can read the State of the Sanderson. It goes down everything um, on that. There will be a Warbreaker sequel eventually. Um, I'm confident that I will write it. I know what it's going to be about and what the plot line of it is and who the characters are and all that stuff. I just have to make sure that it slides in into the right place. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Um, this one from Ruby Belladonna mm -hmm. says, what is your opinion on historical fiction? And other than 10, what are your thoughts on the Final Fantasy games? Which Oh, yeah. Great. Uh, so historical fiction. Um, uh, historical fiction is great. I love historical fiction. It is the, uh, it is the, the actual most similar thing to epic fantasy out there. Uh, we shelve science fiction and fantasy together, and I'm actually glad we do. I'm one of those people who likes that because they do share a lot of similar interests. But a good historical novel um, it hits those same beats, um, that same emotional sort of feel, that same going to a different place and world that epic fantasy does. So I really like historical novels. Um, I don't read as many of them as perhaps I would like to because I feel like I need to keep stay current in my own genre. 
Uh, Final Fantasies. All right, let's see if I can go down the list. Um, so I played Final Fantasies on the U.S. Super Nintendo and Nintendo. What that means is that the Final Fantasies that did not get American releases, I was not hardcore enough of a, uh, of a Nintendo guy um, to get Japanese versions of the ones that did not release over here. Um, so <coughs> um, I love Final Fantasy 1. I. I have played it many, many times. Um, I have played it with various wacky and weird uh, requirements on myself. I have done the five white mages challenge. Thank you very much. Um, I have beaten Final Fantasy 1 with one character leaving the rest dead for every fight. That is really hard because there's some characters, some bosses that have auto kills. Um, and so that can, uh, but this was back when I was in high school and had way too much time. I don't do that sort of stuff anymore. You know, I like to set arbitrary challenges to myself, like beat Wolfenstein with just the pistol. Or uh, There was one Doom I beat with only the chainsaw. I think it's number two, Doom 2. It's the one where you could go back from your starting point, duck around a corner, and there was a chainsaw there. Um, beating bosses with the chainsaw was a lot of fun fun in those games. So, Final Fantasy 1 is a masterpiece. Love Final Fantasy 1. I. I did not get to play, what is it, uh, Final Fantasy 2, I think is the Spoonie Bard one. I didn't get to play that one um, until it came out on um, like a, uh, a handheld later on. Um, I, the only one of those early ones that stands out to me other than one is six. I know there's one in between. I think we got three in the U.S. Um, and then there was seven. Uh, so I think I, we got three different ones, which were like one, three, and six. Six was a ma is a masterpiece. Um, blew my mind. The the mid um, story twist in six blew my mind. I won't give you spoilers, but it just completely um, changed how I see narrative. Uh, still to this day am rocked by, uh, by what happened in the middle of uh, Final Fantasy VI. Uh, seven. So I, um, I went on a mission for my church to Korea for two years from 94 to 96, no, 95 to 97. And um, when I came back, my brother had sold my Super Nintendo to buy a PlayStation so we could play Final Fantasy VII. A move by my brother that I, uh, I endorse um, because I got back to him playing Final Fantasy VII and some of those cutscenes like, guys, you don't understand how cool Final Fantasy VII was. You go back now and you look and you're like, uh, these people look like they were built out of children's blocks um, with dots painted on them for eyes. Those cutscenes were like the thing. Um, and, you know, the, the whole materia system and uh, the things like that and the, the mid-story twist in that one still punches me in the gut and makes me angry. Um... Um, because a certain character that I had leveled up quite a bit suddenly was no longer available to me. Um, love Final Fantasy VII. Um, really liked VIII. Uh, VIII was a level up in graphics to where you can still watch VIII's cutscenes um, and play the game and not cringe. Um, that's how big a jump um, seven to eight was. Um, um, nine was not my favorite. Um, I know a lot of people like it. The, the chibi, uh, sort of, uh, look to it just didn't click with me. I did finish it, but it just wasn't my jam. Um, by then I was also starting to have a problem with the Final Fantasy games that they were just too easy. Um, and while I know the story is why people play them, um, and I do like the characters and stories, I gotta have a game to my game. And the fact that they were getting too easy was really starting to ruin the experience for me. And I tried really hard to make nine harder by giving myself arbitrary uh, limits and rules. And it just didn't work. But then 10 came along and is my favorite Final Fantasy. Um, the addition of voice acting really worked. I loved the protagonist. Um, the, the game just really clicked for me. It came at a time when I had just the right amount of time to play. Loved it. Uh, never played 11, which I think is the first MMO. Um, I could get these wrong. 12 um, 
was the the one with the um, bunny girl. with the bunny girl. Uh, really liked twelve. Um, twelve is the last Final Fantasy that I really liked. Um, if you you know you ask me what kind of trope I like, there's the ship's captain in that one who always talks about how he's the the hero of the story and uh, things like that. I love that guy. Like that character. Um, just was he a Sid? Is it Sid in that one as well? Because that's Final Fantasy VII. I don't think he's a Sid. I think, uh, because there's a Sid in every one of them, but I don't think he's a Sid. I love that character. Um, and enjoyed the evolution of the battle system there. Um, could not get into 13. That's the lightning one, right? I didn't play that one. Could not get into 13. 14's another MMO. Uh, played 15 a little while. Just could not get into the combat of 15. Um... I was really looking forward to it, too, because I thought that the combat would be really fun. Um, and so now we're to the remake of 7, which I haven't played yet. My favorite part of 15 was mm -hmm. sitting in a car and driving yeah, I've without heard that, any that, fast travel. It drove me nuts. <laughs> I've well, heard that's... Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It, yeah. I'll be honest, that <clears throat> when, and I know I should give it another try. When I met the cliched Southern girl um, who had, <laughs> like, the voice acting just drove me up the wall. In the tiny... Uh, yeah, shorts, like whatever. just yeah, drove me up the wall, um, and so I was on board for the you know the party of boy band members, like premise. I like that idea, like three buddies going on a road trip, um, you know the prince and his two friends in their car going on a road trip. That premise was great uh, for me, but I just didn't enjoy the game, and I think you know we can blame dark souls right like i have loved the from software games since the kingsfield games um but when the new director guy came on and did dark uh, demon souls and just gave me a story with lore that's really interesting and a real challenge that challenged me to get better at the game i just fell in love with those games so much um that it's been hard to go back to final fantasy like 15 where what's it oh yes praise the sun uh, I forgot I was wearing this. Um, Many people have asked about the shirt. Yes. So. Um, it's been really hard to go back to Final Fantasy because, like, 15, I felt like I just button mashed. And I actually did the thing where I'd like, stand back and then my two friends just won the fight for me a couple of times early on. And I'm like, Ugh. I know it gets dip more difficult. I know I should give it another try. A lot of people really like, uh, like 15, but... I don't know. I don't know if they're my games anymore, right? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'm the right player for these games any longer. What'd you think of the? Com Sorry, I'm taking over. Yep. What'd you think of the combat system for Twelve, where it's not really fighting? Yeah. You're just setting up a bunch of rules. It worked for me. Really? Um, I thought it was yeah. interesting. It, 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 and I hadn't. Um, I don't know what it would happen to me now, but that was just the right mix uh, for me. Um, but I've gone back and tried to play like, um, like. There are Final Fantasy esque games that you can get that have like the 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 turn based battle systems, and I just cannot get into those games anymore. Um, um, for some reason, I still play Final Fantasy One. Um, maybe it's the nostalgia, but I just it's so hard to get into those these days yeah. for me. Well, if you ever want to give it a try, it ported really well. Or Twelve ported really well to the Switch. Oh, did that, it? That's what oh. I played. played oh, on. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh -huh. um, Zelly says, um, will Tor be doing the weekly online chapters leading up to Rhythm of War like they did for Oathbringer? And would you ever release an entire novel in weekly episodes? I'm hmm. assuming they don't know that you did that with Warbreaker. Yeah. So, yes and yes. Um, I have requested that Rhythm of War have the same thing, and Tor is amenable, so we will be doing that. Uh, before, I really enjoyed the weekly conversations on Reddit and on Tor.com. Um, about the chapters as they came out, um, and I want to do that again. There, there's a certain sort of community that grows up around reading the chapters every week and discussing them um, that I, you know, it would be hard for me to force you to do that for a whole Stormlight book, so I won't. Uh, but when I write the, the sequel to Warbreaker, I will release it online, and I will probably do it as I write the chapters like I did from War, for Warbreaker, please be kind, uh, be, be gentle. I will, um, it'll be first draft when I do that one. It's still a few years off, but I will let you guys see the chapters as I write them. And you will see all the flaws in a first draft of a Sanderson book. So, um, let's do another fan mail. And let me give these things over here. <sighs> Do you want me to give you a question while you're moving? Uh, no. Let's just 
<sighs> yep. It'll be nice when all this is over. Yes, it'll be nice when I can have assistants come grab these things for me. You guys should feel so sorry for, for us celebrities that we have to move our own stacks of paper now. <laughs> I could probably sing you a really, a really bad rendition of, uh, of a John Lennon song to show how much I empathize with you all because my, my life is so hard. Uh, so hard. So, so really hard. I have to, I'm confined to my house as... <laughs> <laughs> At least you don't get to say confined to one of your many houses. I, yeah, so I yeah. confined to my two houses. Um, for those, my other house is the business. We're in my we're in Dragonsteel. It's not really my house, but I do own it. Um, but I don't come over here because this is where everybody works, and we're all trying to social distance, and so people have different sections of the house they go into. But it is funny to be like, oh, poor me. I I have to be confined to my houses um, during this this terrible terrible situation. Um, except I don't leave my house anyway, um, because, you know, uh, I'm me. Uh, so there's one thing. Oh, dear Brandon and hello, Adam, Matthew oh. says. Uh, Hi, one Matthew. big thing, epic fantasy books that I find too hard to swallow, nobody has the same name. I hear you, Matthew. Um, so this is, this is for convenience sake. Um, I've actually done it where I use the same name before. Um, I, you know, like, like Matthew, I assume this is because you're a Matthew and, uh, there's a lot of Matthews out there. It gets so confusing to readers, so confusing. Um, in fact, when I do it on purpose, my editors usually change it because it is so confusing. So I make, um, um, I, I, like in the Stormlight, what I'll end up doing is I'll say there are core names like... I, I've, I've been able to do it in Stormlight. Like, Kaladin's name is based off of Kalak, right? Kalak, Kalak the Herald. You've just, you've, so you've got two characters basically with the same name, or one is based named after the other. Kaladin's name is, our, is the Rosharan version's world, world version of, like, Matthew, right? There is this saint, this Herald. But in, the way I do it so we don't get too confused is I change each one a little bit. Kaladin is their version of Matthew. Shalon is their version of Mary, right? She's named after Shalosh. Um, and so you will see a lot of Shala names and Kala names. And as we had earlier, we have, we have Ishik, right? Who's named after Ishi. And you'll have a lot of Ishi names and things like that. Uh, this is kind of my acknowledgement to you that in a real fantasy world, more of them would probably have a lot of duplicate names like we have now. Um, granted, there are cultures where we, there are much fewer duplicate names than exist in, say, English and, um, and you know, Chinese and things where a lot of duplicate names are used. Um, but you've got, you are noticing a correct thing, and I just have to say, for writing convenience, this is one of these things where uh, fiction has to be stranger than truth. Uh, because otherwise it just gets so confusing. But I bet you could write a book where you did it as it was a plot feature that a lot of people had the same name that you could make it work. Um, uh, you've requested a couple of characters in Stormlight that have the same name. Well, I've done that kind of. That's about as close as we'll get. Um, I do have some minor characters that I'll use the same name for. But like I said, my continuity editor really, really, really likes it when I don't do that and asks me to change them. Uh, thanks for the awesome content you put out and the hard work your team does to facilitate your vision. Uh, my pleasure, Matthew. And uh, I'm, it, it, it is fun that you notice this because this is one of those things, because I love linguistics, that I notice a lot. And I'm like, is there a way around this? Um, and I try to find you know ways that work both for the convenience of telling stories, but also work for, uh, for world building realism. Uh, maybe I'll put two characters with the same name in just for you uh, in the future. We'll see. Um, Habanero Pepper One uh, wants to know if you read poetry uh, while you're writing for inspiration, and if so, do you have any favorite poets? Um, yeah. Um, I really like uh, Sylvia Plath quite a bit. Um, I like Langston Hughes quite a bit. Um... I I like Shakespeare a lot. Um, my wife loves um, Wadsworth, not Wordsworth, Wadsworth. Um, eh, you know, um, um, Frost I really like. Um, I don't read a ton of poetry. Um, basically only when it's like, I need to write some poetry, let's go get in the mood. Um, 
and things like that. Maya Angelou, um, I really like Maya Angelou as well. Uh, but, um, um, yeah. Um, I am not one who's going to generally sit down and be like, I want to read some poetry. Um, but when I read a good poem, it can stick with you like nothing else. Um, and um, is it Maya Angelou who, um, who wrote the, the poem the, about the beating heart, you know, beating I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive? Um, that poem, that poem, I periodically look that one up. I'm not good with memorizing exact uh, phrases. I've had to try to memorize a few, uh, like when people ask me for my favorite Pat Pratchett quote. Um, I'm a good paraphraser. I'm not a good wor word by word. I miss, like, I have lots of friends who can quote scriptures. I can't quote scriptures. I do not remember the exact wording. I, people ask me to write the exact, they're like, will you write the scene from the end of Oathbringer, the quote from there? And I'd be like, let me look it up because I'm going to get, I'm going to get an, uh, an an or a the wrong in this. Uh, that's not how my brain works. My brain works in concepts. Um, and this is why oftentimes, for instance, uh, I'll write characters' names wrong uh, when asked for, sign, uh, for, for a signature because in my head, like, I know this character's name, um, but if I actually write it out, I might write it out three different ways um, because, like, Aiden Alcium, right? Um, there are times where I, where I spell that Aiden Alcium and sometimes where I spell it Aiden, Aiden Alcium. Um, I, you know, eventually settle on one, but I don't know. I don't know if that's just part of the way my brain works or if I'm just lazy, uh, saying that. Did you find that, you know, what poem I'm talking about? I was about? trying to, is yeah. it, uh, the I Still Rise one? No, Which, it's okay. not that one. Um, I'll have to look it up. Um, yeah, I don't do yeah. poetry that much. Mm -hmm. and Somebody knows I'm, which I'm one I'm talking about. I'm swine. Somebody knows which one I'm talking about, um, that, uh, it's the, it's, it's really cool because the, um, the rhythm of the poem feels like a heartbeat, the way that it is written. Um, and she makes the metaphor of the heartbeat proclaiming that you're alive while listening to your, her own heartbeat say, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Um, just really cool use of language that poets do that is beautiful, that is a real good showcase of if you don't understand poetry, that poem explains poetry, at least in my opinion. Um, so... Somebody, somebody in chat knows the one. Yeah, I'm that's what about. I'm. Uh, yeah, I'll keep my eye open yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. um, Jason wants to know if you have a favorite drink or snack while you're writing. Uh, I love ice water. I am a little bit odd in this way that I really don't like most drinks. Um, I don't like most sodas. I don't like most juices. Um, I, I, I like mint tea, um, and I like yuja cha from Korea, but I don't really seek them out to drink them. Um, and I, I really like ice water, but I like it really cold. Um, this is a tr trouble when I go to Europe, um, or really most of the world. People don't understand that when I want ice water, I don't want chilled water. I want a giant cup of ice and the water only filled up as high as the ice goes. Um, if there's water to the point that you can see water underneath the ice, then you have put too much water or not enough ice into your drink. Um, and uh, that's just, uh, I really like really cold ice water. So for the, for the office here, they get, uh, they get pebbled ice. They get a pebbled ice machine. Um, they're so expensive that I basically could only justify it to myself by making it a business expense. <laughs> um, so house number two has pebbled ice. House number one doesn't. So someone said there's a Sylvia Plath poem that says... It's a Sylvia Plath poem. I took a deep breath and yep. listened to the old yep. brag of my heart. I yep. am, I am, I am. I am, I am, I am. There it is. That's it. Sylvia Plath. Thank you, random commenter. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Read that poem, man. That poem is great. Um, but you see how I completely butchered it and misquoted it uh, because even quoting one of my favorite poems, I'm just not going to get it right. Um, Kalyani wants to know what you're currently reading. Uh, still finishing A Dark Shade of Magic. Haven't been able to read uh, as much as I wanted to uh, because I was behind in my, uh, my student reading and I was behind in reading Wheel of Time scripts. And so um, I am now caught up almost. I've got one student uh, final left to do and I've got two Wheel of Time scripts left to offer feedback on. So my reading time has been really pressed for time lately. Um, um, I 
that has nothing to do with Animal Crossing. <laughs> At all. <laughs> um, Udi Kumra um, mm-hmm. says that they struggle to write detail in descriptions. Um, they can get a lot of general description, like what objects are and what shapes they are, but they struggle to get deeper. Do you have any tips? Watch my lecture um, that includes the Pyramid of Abstraction talking about uh, description. Um, that is the best advice I can give you is, number one, use more than one sense. Um, number two, remember that uh, concrete details. Uh, mm. d- describing one thing really well and really concrete to set the mood is generally better than trying to describe the entire thing. Um, the, the description I usually use, you know, um, is if you want to show that you're in a forlorn slum, um, you could just describe everything. You could send pa- pa- pages and pages giving you a description, or you could, you could give a few strong concrete descriptions. Say you're far away from the sound of carriages. You can hear them in the distance, but nobody comes here. You see a starving mangy dog on the corner covered in mud and looking at it at you. You know, it's got covered in mud with patches and fur and it's looking to see if it could take you. Those two descriptions are going to set a scene better than if you went on oftentimes than if you went on for page after page after page. Uh, Here's another one for you, Kara. Um, um, Trying to over describe this entire scene um and so that's been my experience uh do a couple things really well and try to hit more than just visuals um jason says what's something that you do as a part of your daily routine that would surprise most of your readers Ooh. ah hmm i don't know if i'm that surprising of a person um <laughs> Um, I have taught my macaw to use the force. We need to put that on your social media. Yes. Um, most, uh, most people teach birds, uh, wave bye-bye. Uh, I didn't think that was, uh, thematically appropriate enough. And so I taught him, uh, to, instead of go wave bye-bye, he goes, you, he goes like this. We say use the force and he puts his hand up as if he's doing a force push. Um... What's, a, what's something that would surprise them? I don't know. A- am I? I'm not that surprising. I mean, I am a very stable, uh, slow and steady writer who has a very stable personality. Um, I would say that I'm boring, but I happen to really like my life, and I don't think it's that boring at all. Um, but nothing about it surprising. Oh, I don't eat breakfast. Yeah, I don't eat breakfast. Uh, that's, that's a thing. I don't like breakfast. Um, it's a weird meal to me. Uh, it's the most important meal of the day, right? So I just don't eat it. Um, sorry. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's an odd one. Um, my family all loves breakfast and you know, like I like breakfast foods, but they don't feel like a meal to me. It feels like eating dessert most of the time. Um, I w- I like a really hearty English breakfast. But that feels like a dinner to me. I want that as dinner. Um, so, um, Sergio says, when you started writing, did you jump straight into fantasy or did you do another genre first? Uh, my first book was fantasy. Um, my second book was a sequel to that one. So those were both epic fantasy. Um, no, 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 no. My second book was Star's End. My second book was Space Opera. My third book was epic fantasy, I think. Uh, my fourth book was a comedy. Um, not Terry Pratchett style, more of a Bob Aspirin style comedy. Uh, not very good. Um, fifth book was a cyberpunk. Um, and so I did jump around a bit early on, though my very first one was Epic Fantasy. That was White Sand. Not the White Sand you can read. Um, I've actually written White Sand twice. Uh, the first one was real bad. Uh, someday I'll release that one to you guys. And that one I, I won't make... I won't have anybody paying for not even as part of a Patriot or a uh, Kickstarter because it is so bad. Um, but um, yeah, so I did jump right into epic fantasy. I knew what I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure. I'm glad I tried all those other subgenres before settling in epic fantasy. Uh, Launtress was number six. 
uh, after I'd done basically my five book survey of the genre, uh, doing two fantasy subgenres, two science fiction subgenres, I knew that epic fantasy was where I wanted to be. And from there out, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It was until Steelheart that I wrote another science fiction. Um, and even it's like an urban science fiction thing. Uh, Skyward it took till Skyward before I wrote a true science fiction space opera thing again. Uh, Nathan Brown is wondering if you have any advice for a GM playing D and D trying to create their own campaign. Oh yeah. Um, I would think that, um, some of the stuff in my lectures could be of use to you as a GM. Um, GM is, GMing, in my experience, is all about uh, two things. Number one, finding out what each player wants and giving that to that player. Uh, I leveled up mm, like in a huge amount as a GM when I realized if everyone's having fun, it doesn't matter if we're sticking to the rules, right? Like the big level up moment was when I realized one of my players, the thing he wanted most was to just never have his character die. And I know a lot of GMs who'd be like, well, that's just contrary to the nature of playing a role-playing game. They should, should just not play a role-playing game. When I realized if we made this character, um, we, we made him a troll that was a half-dragon that basically was, um, uh, that could regenerate from anything except for fire and acid, but the half-dragon part of him made him immune to fire, and his birth heritage was a ring that made him immune to acid. Uh, so he could regenerate from anything. And I pitched this to the rest of the team as, you get this awesome tool on your team rather than this character is invincible and the rest of you aren't. Um, and then found out from another character in the, uh, player in the party, what he really wanted was to have a deep secret past that slowly came out to the other characters and was dramatic and cool. What uh, another character wanted to do was to have a character that they could make fun and that other players would just laugh at and have fun with. That was Dan, by the way, Dan Wells. Um, he just wanted to be able to be weird. Um, and putting this all together and creating a party where the story was driven by one character's dark past, but they needed the other character's invincibility as a tool to get past challenges that were well beyond what they should be able to do. Letting this other character be the one who was quirky and fun and played into it. Like that campaign is the single most successful campaign I've ever had. And uh, I do know a lot of DMs would be like, you made one character way more powerful than the others. And that could ruin the story, the game for some people. But if you can get all the players on board that they for to, to give the story to everyone the way they want to do it, and you can make that work, you will have the most fun. When it's not about winning, when it's about finding out what makes it fun for everyone. Um, and the, the other thing that, uh, that makes uh, role-playing work, in my opinion, is presenting interesting decisions to the players and letting them actually make the decisions. And you can do that with really great world building because really good world building can present all kinds of interesting conflict and decisions and can give the players opportunity to role play, um, present them with the ways that they can role play the way they want to by presenting them with a really engaging, different, exotic and interesting world. And so um, if you can learn to give them cool decisions that they have to make and a setting that encourages them to, to be part of it and to buy in and to build their own lore into this world, you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, so those are my tips for, world, for, for role playing. Uh, Smash Potter is looking for advice or tips on maintaining interesting or making all viewpoint characters equally interesting. Um, so... One is a um, thing that's going to help make all them interesting. It's making sure that all of them have conflict, meaning all of them have to struggle in some way to deal with what's going on in their life. Um, and this can get distracting if, they're, if it's pulling them all in different directions. So there's a real art to making sure that these separate conflicts for the characters um, are all kind of dovetailing rather than 
scatter spreading. Um, and that's just a matter of practice. Make sure everyone is changing. If you want them to be interesting, then change is a big part of that. Now, there is the caveat that sometimes there are what we call our iconic characters who don't change, who the fascinating part about them is watching them, um, watching them be a master at what they're a master of. And that can work too. You just got to balance it really carefully. Know why a given character in your story. Ask yourself, why might this be someone's favorite character? Um, that's, a, that's, that's kind of a, a litmus test that Peter um, Alstrom came up with. And he'll ask me and say, why might this make, why is this chapter someone's favorite chapter in the book, Brandon? Um, he'll challenge me on that sometimes. And that's usually a really good challenge. It makes me think and be like, how can I make this someone's favorite chapter in the book? Uh, and he'll say, how do you, why is this character going to be someone's favorite character? Um, and know that you're not going to be able to make every character everyone's favorite character, but you should be able to make it so that some percentage of your readership is going to pick that character as their favorite. Um, and you do that just kind of by making sure that there's that, a good mix of confidence and flaws, that there is motion to the character, that they, are, that they are growing, they are changing, that they have motivations that are relatable and that we want them to succeed at or to fail at depending on what type of character they are, right? Like it's all of this stuff um, and learning to do that with fewer words in the case of some of the side characters. Um, a master class in this is, uh, is, as I've mentioned before, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Uh, volume 1, uh, to an extent, but Volume 2 really shows off <coughs> giving multiple characters multiple goals, um, having multiple different character arcs that all dovetail instead of go in different directions, um, and making each of them interesting in their own right, even though a couple of them get the majority of the screen time. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's just a brilliantly written script um, uh, by a really great filmmaker. Um, uh, David Gelber says, if you were fighting an army of super intelligent groundhogs, which Cosmere character would you want to have by your side? Army of super intelligent groundhogs. Kaladin, because they can't fly. Mm. <laughs> Solid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to assume you didn't say magical hedgehog, just really smart. Um, that I don't care how smart your hedgehogs is, are, unless they are an advanced race of hedgehogs with technology and things like that, um, they're not going to be able to get to me up in the, up in the, uh, uh, um, the air. So, Fahad Alzharani, Al sorry, um, how do you prevent what you read from affecting what you write? Um, control it, right? When you're reading what you're reading, identify what's really good about it, what you want to learn from it, and do deliberately saying, I'm going to break down what they did. So <clears throat> this is what I talk about in the kind of cooks versus chefs things in the first lecture uh, that I usually give. Um, your danger is being a cook. Your danger is, is reading something in your unconscious being like, this is successful because it does X and then just doing X. Um, and the X being something surface level. This is successful. Tolkien is successful because it has orcs. Dwarfs and elves. I am going to write orcs, dwarves, and elves. Doesn't mean that there's not there's not good reasons to write orcs, dwarves, and elves. But the the better thing to say is what did Tolkien do that made this world come to life? How can I break that down and practice it myself? So instead of imitating Tolkien by adding orcs and uh, dwarfs and elves, you say. What about the different races in Tolkien is really interesting. What about their dynamic? Can I come up with very different races that have a very different dynamic, but where I learn from Tolkien, this. What is it about Tolkien's use of language, use of songs, use of lore that I really like? Can I do something that uses lore in a similar way, but does not borrow Tolkien's lore, um, or even the, the, the method he used in presenting it? When you are getting good at breaking things down and then getting at the core of what makes them work, you're going to, unconscious influence is going to be much less of a problem to you because instead you're learning the, the better lessons from conscious influence. At least that's my recommendation. Also, don't worry about this quite as much as you probably do. Uh, every author I know worries about this and our general, we are generally in agreement that we worry about it too much. 
Ryan Wall says, you seem to have done a ton of research on many different topics to add accuracy to your books and worlds. Yep. What are some of the most interesting things you've learned in your research? Oh, wow. Hmm. Man, I learned all kinds of stuff about uh, uh, immunology when I was working on the the book, um, Shadows for Silence, or not Shadows for Silence, uh, the Silence Divine, which is why I need to change that title because I already used Silence once. Um, but... Ah, what's what's been really interesting? I love reading about um, and looking at how different types of weapons um, are realistically are, were were used by different armies for different situations and why. Uh, I like um, watching historical recreations of battle and fights, and you know, learning things like, for instance, that. It is really hard to take on two people at once, despite how often we make it happen in fantasy books. Like, all the things that ruin um, ruin really cinematic fights um, are also really interesting and uh, lead you to make cinematic fights that are, in some ways, even better. Um, I wouldn't claim to be the best at this, but um, <clears throat> what's, what's something I've learned? What have I learned? I'd have to open up my notes file. Um, um, oh, I, I learned, this is just random, uh, people using coins as jewelry. Multiple times in different cultures, in order to show off how rich you were, they didn't just put on gold. They actually drilled holes in coins and wore them as jewelry, which is just fascinating. Because, you know, it's almost like the, the sign of opulence we will have by wearing a really fancy watch. It's like shortcutting that to, no, I'm just going to put a big old gold piece on my wrist, right? They would do that. That is so cool. Um, I love finding out stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Walton says, which of the villains from your books would you vote for for president of the United States? Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, um. <laughs> Raythan, probably. Raythan is probably our, your, your best shot at a uh, at someone who, in the end of the day, you would be okay with them having been uh, been president. I'm trying to think of anyone. Um, uh, do not let Taravangian anywhere near the presidency. Um, uh, Lord Ruler, better than Taravangian, still a pretty bad choice. Um, uh, yeah, Let, let's let's just go with that, Brayton. All right. Uh, it looks like I have two more of these left, so I'll do one now. What time are we at? Uh, we are almost to 11. Almost to 11. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, we started at 8.30? Uh, like 8.40. 8.40? Okay. Okay, so we've been on doing, going two, two hours. Yeah. Okay. So why don't I just read these about, two? About two and a half. About two and a half. I'm going to do these last two letters. Okay. Um, and we'll, 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 we're going to do these on Thursdays maybe like every other week from now on. Is that what we're planning? Uh, uh, or every week. Or not, it's up to you. Yeah. So we're going to have to, well, if I'm hit, sitting here doing things, I should be live streaming. So okay. plan these for Thursday nights for a while, guys. Uh, maybe every week, maybe other, every other week, because we got a whole bunch of this coming in because Tor is sending us 8,000 of the, 9,000 of them almost to sign uh, for bookstores. So um, yeah. Uh, I want to know if. <clears throat> Uh, Claude's Phantoms made it to, made it to Idris to stop the lifeless. This is a this is a spoiler. Um, so um, uh, spoils uh, Warbreaker. So I have to have to be very careful. But um, what appears to happen at the end did happen. How about that? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, oh, wait, who is the one who asked from, that? Yeah. This was from Max. Um, can you send me your autograph? Max, I totally can. It, your page is signed. Or send him a, one oh, of these tip-ins as we'll well. Send him a, we'll, we'll send you a tip-in because I should probably keep this. I should probably keep this. What's that? Yeah. yeah. So here is yours, uh, Max. Uh, we probably can't send tip-ins to everyone who asks. Uh, so if that becomes a thing, we may have to send other things. But, but it um, works for Max. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, okay. Well, it's, it works for Max. So... Um, <clears throat> It, do I plan a novel for Renarin, uh, Lunamore, or even Lopin? I do plan a Lunamore, uh, that's Rock, um, uh, novella, 
between books four and five. Um, that is very likely to get done. I would like to do a Lopen novella that's set between books one and two. Uh, that one's not guaranteed, but I do plan to do that. Uh, so thank you, Michael, uh, for your question and for your note. I will uh, get to reading the actual text of these. We just have highlighted for me actual questions uh, later on. Uh, thank you guys all for hanging out with me during the live stream. Um, I know this is a rough time for a lot of people. Um, and um, yeah, I hope I've been able to help a little bit. Um, but you have definitely helped me by keeping me entertained. So I do appreciate that. Uh, we'll see you in about two weeks. So thanks, guys.